studying the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, uh, written by Paul from prison, probably around A.D. 61, uh, during his first Roman imprisonment. The way I take things, it's written to uh, churches in Asia Minor, a group of churches in Asia Minor, predominantly Gentile. And Paul writes it to them from prison. We looked last week at verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1, where Paul praises God for his work in Christ. And he says uh, just so many uh, just amazing, wonderful things. He says, The church, the body of believers, was chosen by God in eternity to be holy and blameless before him. In love, God predestined those in Christ for adoption as his own children. In Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of transgressions. And in the riches of His grace, God lavished on us. Those riches of His grace include all wisdom and and insight. And specifically, God made known through the inspired teaching of the apostles and the prophets the mystery of His will for the handling of the end of history, for the management of the completion of the ages the content of which is to unify heaven and earth in Christ, to bring all things together in Christ. He has a cosmic significance, the eternal state, which will come about in, completion, in conjunction with Christ's return, will be a redeemed creation, a heavenized creation, a transformed creation, from which sin and all of its consequences have been expunged. Okay, it is that glorious picture that we see in Revelation chapter 21. To give you part of Max Turner's quote, I read the whole thing before, but he says, God's blessworthiness is affirmed on the grounds that he has shown us in Christ and in the church the beginnings of his master plan to restore the cosmos to himself and to the harmony lost through rebellion and consequent alienation. All the fragmentation, all of the splits, the alienation, the breaking... Everything that is wrong, that sin has introduced into this creation, will be wiped out. Okay, We will have this new order, this perfect reality, and it's a hope like none other. I'll spare you uh, Andrew Lincoln's quote again. We who are in Christ were as God's children. We were allotted an inheritance in the consummated kingdom of God. The new creation, the new heavens, the new earth will be our home where we will live forever. That's the true promised land. We'll dwell there forever in perfect fellowship with God and with one another. And I just, you know, I used to, I used to tell the folks uh, years ago that on that day, that, that'll be as real to us as sitting here. You see, as real, we will rejoice. There will be a celebration, a, a party on that day like you just can't imagine. And we who are in Christ have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, he says in 113. He's a down payment of our inheritance, a foretaste of the eternal state that serves as a pledge of God's intention to fulfill his promise to redeem his people by taking full and complete possession of them at the consummation. And I read to you a quote from F.F. Bruce on that. When we ended, we were looking at Paul's prayer in, in chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And I'll read that. We'll say a bit more about this. Paul says, For this reason, I for one, since hearing of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you when making mention of you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation regarding knowledge of him, so that you, by the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, may know what is the hope of his calling What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? A power in accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above every ruler and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the coming one. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. Now Paul tells them that because they've been included in Christ with all the blessings that entails, that he had listed and talked about in verses 3 through 14, he doesn't cease giving thanks for them when mentioning them in his prayers. And we talked about that last week. Now his intercessory prayer for them, is stated in verse 17 through the first part of verse 19. 
And that's where I want to pick back up this morning. In, that, in verses 17 through 19, where he says here, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, starting there. Paul is praying that God may give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation regarding knowledge of him. He says, so that by the eyes of their hearts having been enlightened, they may know certain things. And he then enumerates the things he wants them to come to know at a heart level. Now with most commentators, and with the NIV and the TNIV, I think the spirit here is a reference to the Holy Spirit rather than the human spirit. And I think that in part because it's difficult to understand the human spirit as a spirit of revelation. Okay, now if that's correct, then Paul is praying that the Spirit of God who lives in them, he's praying that the Spirit will impart to them wisdom and revelation concerning God, that he will effectively manifest himself in their lives as the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. He wants the Spirit to bless them this way. Let me read to you a couple of, a couple of fellows. Gordon Fee He says in his book, God's Empowering Presence, he says, The prayer is not for some further spirit reception, but for the indwelling spirit whom they've already received to give them further wisdom and revelation. The emphasis, therefore, is not in receiving the spirit as such, but on receiving or perhaps realizing the resident spirit's gifts. So Paul is praying that in their lives the spirit will manifest himself as a a spirit of wisdom and revelation by enlightening their hearts on these specific matters he wants them to grasp at a heart level. He wants them to get this, to internalize this. Harold Honer says in his commentary, Paul is not praying that that they be given the Holy Spirit, for he's already been imparted to them. Rather, he is praying for a specific manifestation of the Spirit so that the believers will have insight and know something of God's mysteries as a result of the Holy Spirit's revelation. He wants the Spirit to open their eyes, to reveal these truths to them in a deep way so that they may understand certain things. And the goal of this enlightening from the Spirit for which he's praying is that they may grasp at a heart level certain truths of God specified in the second part of verse 18 and in the first part of verse 19. He wants them to to internalize, to come to know, to grasp at a heart level He says, by the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believes. He wants them to grasp and understand these things, these three things. Now the relationship of these uh, these three clauses, you see, he wants them to understand what is, what are, what is. And the relationship of those three clauses, it's just not all that clear. Now, contrary to standard Greek usage, in English, when we, want to, when we have a series of parallel things, if we say Steve, comma, Tom, comma, and John, well, they all stand in parallel. But in Greek, if you wanted to do that, you would, st- you would say Steve and John and, or Steve and how, whatever names I was using. You'd, you'd put a conjunction between them all. Okay, there is no conjunction here between the first two. Okay, so it looks like they are, it looks like the first two are to be paired together, and then that pair paired with the third. Okay, that's not, that's not necessary. Okay, that rule doesn't make it impossible to understand them as parallel clauses. In my view, and in the view of Fee and a number of other people, it makes it more likely. And it makes more sense to me. What I think is going on here, he says, what is, And then he elaborates on that hope in the second one by saying, what are? And then he gives you the third one. So the second I take is an extension. It is an elaboration on the first. And I think you can see how that that makes sense. In Fee's words, he says, the first two clauses form a pair, which together are paired with the third. Okay, now you can take it the other way, because many commentators do. But I think, given his normal Greek usage, I'm leaning over here the way Fee and some other people see it. Now, Paul wants them to comprehend what? The glorious hope into which God has brought them by calling them to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. He wants the eyes of their hearts to be enlightened concerning this hope. He wants them to get it, to understand, to really internalize what is the glorious hope into which God has brought them. He wants them to understand deeply, see what is in store for them. What is the content of their hope? What's it about? 
What is the Christian hope? He wants them to understand that at a deep level, okay, which he then describes in the next clause as the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints. Okay, what is the hope that he's called you to? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints? That is the hope. That is what he wants them to grasp. Uh, Peter O'Brien says in his commentary, the hope to which God has called them is linked with the summing up of all things in Christ, which is the final purpose of God's saving activity in His Son. What he mentioned in verse 10, this bringing of all things together, this heavenization of creation. He wants them to understand what is their hope. And this isn't just academic. When we get through this section, I'll, I'll make a point of that. It's not simply academic. They need to grasp this at a heart level. As I said in in commenting on chapter 1, verse 11, those in Christ have been allotted an eternal inheritance in the consummated kingdom of God, the renewed cosmos of perfect love, peace, and harmony that was accomplished through Christ. We will forever appreciate that. But we've been allotted an inheritance in that consummated kingdom He's the one through whom all things have been brought together. The one through whom the things in heaven and the things on earth will be brought together, will be merged. That's why I use that term that reality, this creation will be heavenized. It'll be redeemed. Okay, Christ is the one who brings that about. And we'll live forever in the new heavens and new earth in resurrection bodies that are immortal and imperishable. As Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15 through 57, Paul says in Romans 8, 23 and 24, We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Okay, he wants them to grasp. He's praying, get a grip. Understand more deeply than you have. I pray that the Spirit will enlighten you so that you will grasp more deeply than you ever have what is the hope, the glorious hope into which God has brought you. He elaborates on that when he says, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance among the saints? That is the inheritance that has been allotted to us in the consummated kingdom of God. And we need to grip that. We need to understand that. Because it has tremendous devotional consequences in the here and now. It is not simply abstract stuff that you can sit around and talk about. That hope has tremendous empowering effect in living in the here and now. He wants them to understand that. He wants them to get a grip on that and understand that. That is the hope. In that hope we have been saved, as he says in in Romans chapter 8. The inheritance is called his God's inheritance, because Paul is is emphasizing that God is the one who provided it for us. We got that from God. Okay, he wants them to understand that. Now, you see those two things, but in addition, see, to comprehending the glory of their future, okay, what is this hope? You know, what this glorious inheritance? He wants them to understand at a heart level that, But he also wants them to understand something else. He wants them to comprehend at a deeper level God's work in their past and in their present. Okay, not simply the hope, but he wants them to grasp what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. He wants them to appreciate the greatness of God's power directed toward believers as that power has been exercised on our behalf in rescuing us and exalting us in Christ, and as that power is available to us constantly for living for His glory. So how that power has been exerted in our past, how it's available to us in His present, and what is the hope of our future? He wants these saints to grasp that at a heart level. And that power that has been exercised in our past and that is available for us for daily living, he says, is is in accordance with. Look at this. He says, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? A power in accordance with the working of his mighty strength when he exerted, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The power that is at work in us, that has worked on our behalf and that is available for us now, is analogous to. It is similar to, parallel to, 
in accordance with the power that God exercised on Christ's behalf when he raised him from the dead, the ignominy of the death of crucifixion. He took Christ from the lowest human experience. The lowest death you could die in the ancient world was crucifixion. I've said many times here, when we have a death penalty in this society, when somebody's worthy of it, they all die the same way, whether it's injection, electric chair, whatever it is. That's not how it was in the ancient world. They had different ways of killing you. Crucifixion was the worst form of punishment in terms of shame and with the message of it, it was the lowest death that could be died. God takes Jesus from the lowest human experience and by his power raises him to a position above every name and power and authority in heaven on earth, good or evil. Now that's power. You see, that is power that will take one from that position and go, Shoo. well, he says the power that God has exercised toward us the power that we have available in living is in accordance with that. Well, this ought to be something. Now, this ought to be something to really rejoice about. It's in accordance with it. See, the supremacy to which he exalted Christ. God raised him that way. The supremacy to which he exalted Jesus is... He takes him, he raises him, and he raises Jesus to a permanent position, something that encompasses both the now and not yet. Okay, Jesus has taken from this shameful position, people mocking him, you know, probably naked. That's how they crucified people, because it enhanced the shame. Just the worst experience, and he raises him above every name for the now and the not yet. Okay, he exalts him. Listen to what O'Brien says. He says, the distinction between this age and the coming age is drawn from Jewish apocalyptic... With the first coming of the Lord Jesus, the new age has already broken in upon the present. I talked about that the first week. Talked about that some last week. He says the new age has already broken in upon the present so that the two ages now overlap. The age to come has been inaugurated, but not yet consummated. And it is this future sense that Paul refers to it here. So Jesus' exaltation is for the now and the not yet. He has been taken by the power of God from the lowest position to this permanent exaltation. And you say that is power is in accordance with the power that he's exercised toward us and the power that is available to us. God directed analogous power toward Christians. He says in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, okay, we're going to get to that, but he says there, right, that we were dead in transgressions and sins, And God made us alive in Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. You say, how is the power that God exercised in taking Jesus from death and exalting him above every name on a permanent basis, how is that analogous to, similar to, in accordance with the power that he exercised toward Christians? Well, he took us from death. That's what he says in chapter 2. He took us from spiritual death, alienation from God, and he raised us up with Christ. He has made us. He has exalted us. We are children of God. How did that happen? It happened by God's power. So he wants them to understand at a new level not only the hope that's in store for them, what they have as a hope. He wants them to understand the power that God exercises toward believers. He has taken us from death and he has exalted us. And that power is available to us today, as we'll see in chapter 6, as we are engaged in spiritual warfare in this overlap of ages. If we are engaged in a war, and if we don't understand that and and recognize it, uh, we're going to be vulnerable. Sitting ducks, you see. He directs that power toward us, not only in the initial deliverance and exaltation, but in our ongoing spiritual warfare, as I'll talk about in 40 weeks when I get to chapter 6. And it may take that long. But he adds in in chapter 1, verse 22, he says that the one under whose feet God has subjected all things was given that position. He was given in that position to the church. The one under whose feet all things have been subjected, he is given in that position to the church. Christ's dominion over the cosmos is for the benefit of believers. As O'Brien puts it, 
The church, therefore, it's not going to be defeated by any power in the sense that God's purpose for it will be thwarted. How can that happen? It can't. And it won't. God's purpose for the church is not going to be thwarted, as Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, 18. Not even the gates of death, the gates of Hades, the realm of the dead, will prevail against it or overcome it. You see, nothing is going to defeat God's purpose for the church. Okay, he is going to carry it through. And he also says in in verse 23 of chapter 1 that the church is the body and fullness of Christ. The body and fullness of Christ. He's head over all things in terms of authority, right? But he's head over all things in terms of authority, but only the church is his body. You see, there's something distinctive about the church. And i got to say, you know, the, the attitude that is, for a long time has been out in the society, this idea that, well, you know, I'm all for Christ and all that, but the church, I just, you know, the church is just a drag. I just don't like the church. I just don't like the church, 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 church. Look what the church is. Look what this church is, this idea that I think I'll just float off and be a Christian out here by myself because I'm really spiritually cool and I'm spiritually better than everybody. I can't, I, I can't hang with those people. Have you seen them? You know, from the old Seinfeld, it's like a leper colony down there. You know, I can't, I can't. No, I, I'm just going to be off and be doing my own thing. But when you look at the church and what it is, I mean, the church is his body. The church has a unique relationship with the Lord Jesus. It's characterized not only by dependence and subordination on the part of the church, but also by a special fondness and concern on the part of the Lord. You see that in Ephesians 5.29. He has a special fondness and concern for the body. Okay? He loves the world. I understand that. But don't let that diminish the significance of the body of Christ. It is important. It is amazing, in fact, what he has made the church. Now, the glory of the church is expressed in the statement that it's the fullness of Christ. Okay, the church is the fullness of Christ, meaning it is that which is filled with and by Christ. Fullness in a passive sense. The church is filled with and by Christ. It's the community which he fills supremely with his presence and his dynamic rule. Where do you think that is happening? Do you think that's happening in the world? They know about Christ, but the church is where his presence and dynamic rule is especially felt and at work. Right? Aren't we the people who are filled with his spirit? Aren't we the people who are bowed before him and seeking to do his will? To work in this world? To extend his influence? To bring the loss to him? Yeah. So, you know, this idea, this negativity toward the church which we've kind of bred, you know, I said, no, just hang out on your own. Christianity is a corporate thing, okay? It is a corporate thing, and you have to see something of the glory of the church. Now, it's true that Christ fills the cosmos in every way. He says that he fills the cosmos in every way in the sense that as God is said to fill heaven and earth, he pervades all things with his sovereign rule, and he directs them to the divinely appointed goal. So that's certainly true, okay? It is true that he he fills the cosmos in every way, but he fills the church in a special sense. He fills the church with his spirit and his grace and his gifts so that only the church is his fullness. Only the church is his fullness. He's head over everything, ruler of all, but there's something special and distinctive about the body of Christ. And we need to understand that when we harm the body of Christ. Okay, understand something of what it is. Now, Paul wants their hearts to be enlightened regarding these matters. Because, as I said, it's not simply a matter of abstract theology, so Paul can sit here and have debating points with people. That's not what it's about. He wants their hearts to be enlightened regarding these matters because it will strengthen them for life today. It has devotional consequences. Grasping this stuff at a heart level has tremendous devotional consequences. It affects how you live today. If you grasp what is in store for the Christian, what is the hope that God has given us, that will have tremendous empowering effect in your life here and now. 
You see, I used that example before. I used to like the television show, uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles. They cut it and broke my heart. But, uh, but it was, you know, one of the things that you can see there is, you know, it's about this future war with machines and all this stuff, and people come back in time. And there's just a few people who really know what the future holds. And they're living their lives for that. And you say, well, why are they doing that? Because they know what the future holds. So everybody else thinks they're crazy. Yet they're saying, listen, you may think I'm crazy, but I know something. And I'm living my life that way. I'm giving my life in light of the truth I know about the future. Well, that's how it works. And so Paul prays for them, if you will grasp this at a heart level, it will have tremendous impact on you. It will help you to stand the difficulties in this overlap of ages because this place is tough. Look around. This place is tough. And that will strengthen you in this battle. And it will strengthen you in the battle that he's going to talk about in Ephesians chapter 6. So you also you have this idea, if you grasp what at a deep level, at a heart level, you really internalize and understand the power that God has directed toward believers, both in their exaltation, taking them from alienation, spiritual death, being cut off from God, having no hope, taking them and exalting them and making them his children, that's power. And if you understand that that power has been exercised on your behalf, you will be appreciative of that. You will understand what has been done on my behalf and you'll remember that and that will strengthen you for daily living. And if you understand the power that is at work now, there is power to change your life. The power that exalted Christ, the power that rescued you, is available for the Christian to transform your life. Why do we always go to pagans when we want to fix something? Why do we do that? What can a pagan tell me about a spiritual problem? Now let me tell you something. Part of how our culture works, by the way, we are infatuated with materialism. We think that there's no such thing as a spiritual reality, and all of us are, in essence, chemical robots. You're simply electrical impulses and all that stuff. So if there's anything wrong with you, I simply need to figure out the right chemicals to fix you. Okay, you are a machine. They deny the spiritual aspect. And so they search for, well, what can we do? Well, there's a gene. This gene makes somebody do this. This gene makes somebody do that. You see, because they don't believe in a spiritual reality. So we have taken spiritual problems and shrunk them all down into mechanical problems. Okay, now can there be mechanical problems? There can be. Okay, there can be. But I'm saying to you, our society is so bent with its mindset on materialism, it is taking all spiritual problems and forcing them into the mechanical problem box. Okay, that's one of the things they do. And then secondly, we look at the pagans and say, they're the ones that have the answers. To a spiritual problem. You want to know how to overcome something? Well, go to this guy who doesn't believe in God. Now, of course, they're biblical counselors. I understand that. But you can just, I get this picture of this guy sitting there stroking his beard. Well, yes. He's going to tell you something. Okay, well, listen. What I'm saying to you, what the Bible says is there is tremendous transforming power. There are reprobates. People who are completely immersed in sin. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What does Paul go through? Drunkards, homosexuals, all that. Who transformed them? He says, that's what you were. Don't tell me there's not power in Christ to live a different life. I don't want to invite somebody to something and say, listen, you're going to stay in this. I want to be free. I want to be different. And God calls you to that. He can change you. Transform you, make you a new person, overcome those things. Now, can you fight him? And yeah, you can. That's true of everything. But if you will embrace Christ and let the Spirit of God transform you, He will make you over into His image. He will do it. And we do people a disservice when we don't tell them, listen, God will change you. God will change you. You need to pray, you need to study, and you need to open your life to allow the Spirit to transform you to overcome these things. I says, well, you know, I'm just insensitive to other people. I think I need to go to counseling. You need to repent. Okay, you need to understand that. All right, enough of that. 
But this, see, this, this has big stuff. I'm telling you, Paul wants them to see this. He wants them to see this because this isn't idle talk, abstract stuff. See, people say, well, you know, you don't want to get too involved in theology. It's, you know, just, look, theology affects life. It's not simply to sit around and talk. It is because it, it feeds back in to how we live, how we glorify God. And he wants them. Why do you think he's praying this for them? He wants them to see that. Okay, he says here in chapter 2, which we'll just get to touch on. Chapter 2. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you once walked according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now working among the sons of disobedience. We all also once lived among them in the lusts of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and we, like the rest, were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, so that he might show in the coming ages the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works, so that no one may boast. For we are his product, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance in order that we should walk in them. Okay, he's got a lot to say here. He's got a lot to say. In the first three verses you see that we were dead in transgressions and sins. As Christ had been dead physically as a result of the crucifixion, they'd been dead spiritually, meaning they were alienated or separated from God as a result of transgressions and sins. Now, these are just two different flavors. Sin is disobeying God. It's, it's acting contrary or violating the will of God. Whereas to transgress is to violate the will of God as revealed in an express commandment. Okay? So you have all... You know, you know, transgression is sin. Here's how Moo puts it. He says, transgression denotes a specific kind of sin, the passing beyond the limits set by a definite positive law or command. While every transgression is also a sin, not every sin is a transgression. Transgression is a subset of sin. You say, how can that possibly work? Well, think about your kid. You can think sometimes your child does something, you say, you knew better than that. You knew better than that. Why? It was because of just living in things and other things that you'd said. They knew better than that. Now, that's one level. The other level is you look the kid in the eye and say, listen, I'm going to go out, and you better not go in the street. Do you hear me? Okay. There's a different level. You see, one is the violation of an express specific commandment. The other is a violation of a will that is more generally known. All right, so in any event... The point why he uses these two, the point in the combination that conveys the fullness and the variety of their sinful past. So that's what he talks about when he says, look, you were dead in the transgressions and sins. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once walked. They lived that way in conformity with the worldly age. Okay, that's how they were living, in conformity with the worldly age and in conformity with the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now working among the sons of disobedience. You were living this way. To live in conformity with the worldly age is to follow the attitudes, the preferences, and the, the habits of this fallen world which are alien and hostile to God and his standard. This world, what does this world think about God? Just look around. You are mocked. You are ridiculed. This world is hostile to God. It is alien to God. This world is in rebellion to God. And so to live in accordance with the worldly age is to go along with those attitudes and preferences and habits, to live in conformity with them. And it's also, as the next clause clarifies, to live in step with or under the influence of Satan, who is here called the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now working among the sons of disobedience. You know, Satan is, uh, you know, this idea how he, well, he's, first he's extremely clever. Uh, you know, the idea that he's a buffoon. Uh, it's, you know, just, just a buffoon. Uh, that's not so. You see, in, in, these, in dealings, uh, Satan is, is very, very clever. He's not this red guy in tights that we make up and go, ha, 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 yeah, <laughs> Satan, yeah, Satan. 
Okay? And, and to not recognize that is to make, a, make a, a huge mistake. Now, Satan is the god of this age. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the, the god of the old fallen order, which, though still present and evil, as Paul says in Galatians 4.4, 4, is already doomed and expiring. Okay? It's like the example people have used. D-Day has already happened. Okay? He's through. But he's still present until the consummation. The Apostle John says the whole world, in the sense of everything that's opposed to God, lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John 5, 9. And elsewhere he calls Satan the ruler or prince of this world. Okay, so to live this way, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you once walked according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of the domain of the air. The spirit now at work in the sons of disobedience. It is to live in accordance with the perspective of this alienated world, this world that's apart from God and in rebellion to him, and it is to live under the influence of Satan. Now, what do you do if you, somebody said that to you? And this is our area. You can't, you can't say that people are under the influence of Satan. No, I can. I can. You know, I had some guy one long time ago talking to me. He was just like, I thought he was going to fall out of his chair when I told him something. You know, I believed in spiritual powers. And, oh, what? You see, that's so contrary to our mechanistic, materialistic world. That says, no, none of that stuff. You know, it's all about, if I can't see it in my test tube, I'm looking at it in my microscope. I don't see it there. You see, then it's not real. Okay, well, that's just, you're in the bag then. Satan has already got you. He said, no. No, no, no. Okay, that's, that's just stupid. All right, good. That's what he says. Good. You're not even aware of the battle. You're a sitting duck. But there's some interesting stuff here that he says. He's called the ruler of the domain or realm of the air because he's the chief demon. And air was understood in both paganism and Judaism as the abode of evil spirits. Okay, now that's kind of an interesting idea. See, the air is the lower reaches of the heavenly realms. Okay, the lower reaches of the heavenly realms. What would be called the first heaven in that threefold division that Paul seems to use in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. You have, you know, the heavens where the birds are and flying here. Then you have outer space, out beyond that, which is the second heavens. Then you have the true heavens, okay, the, the abode of God. So atmosphere and up here was considered the abode of evil spirits. So it's, it's this lower reaches, reaches of the heavenly realm. So Paul can say that the spiritual forces of evil in 612, he says what? They occupy the heavenly realms. Okay, so there's no inconsistency there. But what's up with this thing about the air? Well, whatever else is meant by the notion that demons inhabit the air, it says something about their proximity and access to mankind. And it probably says something about their mobility and their invisibility. Okay, now I don't know if this freaks you out, because if you've created a, a world of, you know, listen, I, th this stuff isn't real, but it is. Okay, it is. And so he's telling them that they are serving at, under the influence of these spirits and powers. And Satan also is said here to be the spirit who's now at work among the sons of disobedience. He is actively influencing mankind to act contrary to the will of God. He is plotting. He is working. He is alive and well. Okay? Moving people to get them to work contrary to the will of God. So Paul can say in 6.12 that our struggle is what? Not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world controlling powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a spiritual battle that is going on. There is a spiritual battle that is going on. And we have to be tuned into it. Now, Satan doesn't overpower Christians so that we have no choice or control in our actions. One scripture that early in my Christian life was a great source of peace to me is James 4, 7. He says, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay? Rather, his modus operandi, the way he works... See, is it through deceitful scheming and temptation? He's a plotter. Okay, and you can see in Ephesians 6, 11, for example, it refers to what? The schemes of the devil. Okay, and you think you can go in a battle of wits with him. Mm. You see, it's like a child with a kidnapper. You, that kidnapper starts engaging that child, and though you've told your little child everything, listen, you don't have the sticks. You don't have the ability to go to battle. 
because he is wise. He has lived a long time. He understands mankind and has witnessed mankind from Jump Street. And he knows. He knows what moves us, how we like, what things we want. Okay, so he's a powerful foe, but he's not somebody here who comes and denies somebody. Now, possession is another issue. Uh, Terry mentioned that last week, and when we get to six, I may say something about that. Okay, but I'm convinced that Christians aren't possessed, can't be. Okay, doesn't mean they're not influenced. Okay, but possession is another order of influence. Okay, but I'll say something about that again when we get to six. You see this method of plotting, like illustrated with Eve in the garden. Right? He, did, he duped her. How did he get? He duped her. He didn't deny her choice, didn't overpower her, but he, he, he duped her. Now, his subtle training and conditioning, this is how I see his working. His subtle training and conditioning, you see, it leads people so far from God that, that his reality and the truth of the gospel seems like a fairy tale. He just pulls them. No, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And then you're over here and you come and you say to somebody about spiritual truth and they go, what are you, crazy? All that there is is what I can touch and grab and you must be a nut. What are you, one of these uh, religious people? I heard that second bell. Thank you for coming. <laughs>